I think the cloud is quite cool. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us again and off to you Nada. Thank you so much. So I'm Nada, I've seen a few of you, um, uh, well, in some of the other uh, Fashion Liberation Collective talks. So Salaam Alaikum, Zayuku, I'm Yichatzilev, how are you? I'm Nada Kresh and I'm the founder of Fashion Liberation Collective North Africa. Um, and I just thought I'd, introduce some of the things we'll be talking about, why we started the collective, why I started the collective, why members are members of the collective, and what memes and decolonizing the memes and picking them apart has to do with fashion and has to do with any kind of decoloniality. So I always like to use this image on the left. It's two images. Um, collaged on top of each other if you will um but it's almost like the focus of my doctoral study the focus of my academic practice a lot of the drive to create uh this collective was to reclaim rewrite our histories but also to um kind of adjust the stereotypes that we have to live with every day which were a result of colonialism and obviously like the orientalist art movement which I like to think of as colonialism's Twitter. Um, so what you have here is that fantasy versus reality and how fantasy really covers up the reality and the true beauty of a native people. Um, and in this case, North Africa. These are some of the things that I'm involved with. Uh, I teach at Cardiff School of Art and Design, Cardiff Met. I'm also a permanent lecturer at UE Bristol on, well, the fashion communication degree, but I'm Cardiff Met, it's a more fluid kind of post. Um, I'm also the North African hub for not RCDF. Um, and I'm involved with decolonizing the curriculum for Wales. I'm also a face academic and yeah. So um, as I said, I'm called Nada, Nada Quraish. I'm many things to many people, but for the purpose of this talk, uh, I'm hoping to just be a humble guide uh, for you fellow explorers on this journey. Um, and I'm also a researcher, disruptor, and my research is a complex mix of disciplines. So all inspired and initially driven by the need to belong and to understand being other, if you will. So through my career, which was predominantly based in fashion design in the East and the West, uh, I noticed patterns that I now know are results of hundreds of years of false narratives, but also the results of a persistent image um, being portrayed by the media or by art um, and a you know, continuous uh, multitude of false narratives fueled by stereotypes and definitions imposed by us, the ones colonized through Orientalism, Oriental fashion and cultural appropriation. Um, I'm intrinsic, intrinsically linked to multiple identities, Egyptian, North African, British, Turkish, colonized, colonizer, which have directed me to question how fashion has cemented over a century a fantastical exotification of the Orient in the West's mind. Now memes, I think fashion is a meme. I think it functions as a meme and Spike will elaborate on what a meme is. Um, but I think that it is just another manifestation of these false narratives, which fashion has played a very, very pivotal role in. Um, so before we begin, I'd like you guys to kind of write some of the things that come to mind. Um, as we delve deep into the world of memes, well, as deep as we can get in an hour, um, the fictional orient coloniality, and we will be actively decolonizing the meme. But first, um, I just wanted to tell you a bit more of really why I started FLCNA or Fashion Liberation Collective North Africa. Um, I was recently asked a question at the FACE Summit is, something surrounding who do you let be part of the collective? You know, I was asked by a few people, 
um, who's allowed in the collective? You know, do you let white people in? Is it only North Africans that are allowed into the collective? And that question really led me to rethink our mission statement and our aims. Um, and when I first started the collective, it was due to finding kind of this gaping hole where our history or our true authentic history, design archives, visual culture, identities should have been. I went searching and I found a real lack of literature or peer reviewed accounts and academics who basically looked like me and who were from the same background as me. Um, apart obviously from Edward Said um, and Jack Shaheen. Uh, but I was confronted with my past and that lack of belonging and the constant kind of identity crisis I had grown up with. Um, and well, uh, if I dare say most post-colonial youth deal with, and I wanted to achieve more than design for us, by us, for the rest of the world. I want archives. I just want more. And I want to embrace non-North Africans and deal with the dire ongoing effects of colonialism on the global majority. Um, so my answer to that question is that we are regional as a start, but we have great ambition to grow and spread to different regions. And I have really integral members and allies like James and Spike, who are also from a colonized country that I mentioned before, Wales. Um, so if you have the same ideology and the same drive and that believe in equity, not equality, equity in art and design, then you are welcome. So my answer to that question was that, no, it's not just for North Africans, although fundamentally because my background is North African, you know, we deal predominantly with this as our first, first kind of building of a collective, but we do hope to move on to different regions around the world. Um, we really wanna create a space for debate, critique, social commentary, and we really want to embrace decoloniality and move forward as one and as a combined effort. And I think it takes everyone together working collaboratively to achieve that. And yeah, eventually we do want there to be an FLC worldwide for every single nation around the world. Um, some of the, the things I also, we, we, well, I also address in Orientalism, which also translates into memes a lot of the time, is again that fantasy versus reality. And I don't need to kind of point out to you guys the differences between the two images you're seeing. Um, one being Rosati's harem dance, uh, which was a you know really famous Orientalist painting versus a real Caspar harem photocon from the same time. And so these, you know, that's another issue, I think, for another time, that Orientalist tale and self-orientalizing, etc. cetera. Um, but these are some of our amazing and awe-inspiring members. Um, some you have seen speak. So that was the collage I was referring to of James's. This is Spike's work. Um, and some hopefully we'll be able to bring to you in future presentations. So I'm wearing Shafia Al-Wakil, who's on the left there's work. This is some of the stuff we do. We try to create almost a unique North African design aesthetic and identity, but not just through our um, designs and through our artistry, but also through our commentary, through the way we um, tackle difficult subjects and memes being one of those. So even the things we share on social media are quite significant in terms of what we choose to share and how we share it. And alas, we have reached our final stop from me for now. And people I would love to have in our collective would be Hassan Hajjaj, um, because this is what I see the future of North African fashion going, a positive and hopeful outlook, um, offering an authentic take on high-end fashion through a different lens and perspective with a little bit of humor. So I see this as being the future of North African design. Um, and yeah, I just really, really appreciate the artistry behind this. But now we will come back to the now and present 
and look at some of the other symptoms of colonialism, orientalism, identity confusion, and the pure power of the meme. Now, before that, I would like to show you this meme, just to remind you that um, everything about fashion is a meme. It functions as a replicator and communicator on a global level, but also that memes are very, subjective so if you're not from that culture you might not necessarily appreciate it as a meme but you may this is a meme that I found quite entertaining because it mixes um Egyptian modern a kind of pop culture with a very famous Egyptian ce celebrity Fifi Abdul and it mix mixes the, the the ongoing viral joke about Liz Truss and the lettuce and the lettuce living out you know outliving Liz Truss so I'm gonna hope it works now. Let's hope it does work. Right, one minute. Yay, I heard a whole say. Matter of fact, what could a whole say? Would but I just thought that is worth sharing because it is a meme that kind of melds those two worlds together. So thanks for listening, and I'm gonna pass you over to Spike. Oh, wait. Nice, thanks. Uh, let me just try and share. Yes, and I'll bear with me. Oh. oh, sorry, Spike. Before you go, I also forgot yeah. to say, <laughs> forgot to say how this whole thing started. So maybe you can do that because I didn't mention it. Oh, in terms of the... Of our collaboration. Yes, that's fine. Is that my slides or my notes showing now? I can't see anything. No, there's nothing, is that? <laughs> <laughs> Just that Spike Dennis. <laughs> Not showing screen, am I? Oh, it's worked so well last time, didn't it? Do you need me to share your... Are you okay? Uh, I don't know what I've done now. Mm -hmm. And maybe also just tell us a little bit about ourselves, about yourselves, because um, I didn't really explain that very well either. Anyway, right. Yes, there we go. I can see. Is that my notes or my slides now? It's everything. It's everything. So if, uh, go up, present a view. What happens there? Right now, it's your notes and your slides as well, but in a present uh, view. Hang on, can I change that? Can you share them your own? Is that a, yeah. I'll just give you a prod. Sorry, I'm slightly embarrassed. I'm normally the techie guy. You are. <laughs> right, one minute, one minute. Let me just do slideshow. Oh dear, oh wait. Can you see? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Cool. Can everyone see like a big slideshow or is it just? Yeah, it's okay. all good. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, Croiso, welcome. Um, so, I'm uh, an artist and lecturer based in um, South Wales and Wales. Um, as for James's uh, session earlier, I guess uh, you know, perhaps another imposter, as in, in the sense I'm not strictly from a fashion background, uh, but trying to find my, my another place to fit in and contribute. Um, I'm just going to talk through, I guess, a little introduction to myself and then uh, a bit of context relative to memes and uh, just a kind of generally kind of, uh, a fairly high level really just to sort of conceptualize where we're going with this so next one please nada so i've been as an artist i've been making post internet art for you know the best part of a decade i suppose and i've explored the realms of catfishing and unsolicited dick pics of which i won't show you any here and uh technological taxidermy as well which was interesting but recent research has kind of led me down the rabbit hole that is internet meme culture 
Um, and it's something that's influenced my work. I'm a teacher now as well. We've been sort of teaching a, a module in Cardiff on, which I'm currently doing at the moment, actually, with some second year undergraduate students. Um, and so it's influenced, influenced that, both those practices. Um, and I suppose what's, what is a meme is kind of open to debate. If we go back to kind of Dawkins' initial conception of the term back in the 70s, um, it's a very sort of loose open term, which kind of allows for that interpretation of, say, fashion as a meme that Nada was pitching. Um, but I guess for the purposes of the kind of workshoppy bit that follows this, we're sort of primarily focusing on internet memes. And it's in the context of internet memes that the word meme has really kind of sort of found its foothold. Um, but I kind of see memes as hyper objects. So these are kind of, this is a term coined by Timothy Morton to describe objects that are massively distributed in space and time. Uh, sort of they're objects that kind of withdraw from us and are hard to locate and kind of put your finger on in a kind of, in a, in a kind of substantial sense. And they're objects that kind of pervade our existence. They kind of, you know, we, we sort of can't escape them. Um, uh, but oh, they're also the common language of the internet. Um, so Ryan Milner describes them as the lingua franca of the age of the internet. Um, and so as well as being accessible to the masses, being that kind of language of the people of the internet, they also have agency and power um, beyond just as flicking past them as we kind of do scroll through Instagram or whatever it may be. Next, please, Nara. So some recent work I've been making attempts to kind of synthesize the visual language of image macros, which are a, a kind of form of internet memes. So those text and image combos that kind of uh, epitomize the kind of early days of internet memes in kind of web two. Um, and it, I, I attempts to kind of bring these together with sort of surreal and nonsensical sensibilities that we might associate with internet shit posters or possibly even then artists, you know, if we're sort of talking artistic canon, artists from the Dada and Fluxus movements um, in that sense. Um, whilst at the same time kind of challenging some kind of pertinent or political messages relative to sort of contemporary society and culture. So these works are based on appropriation. Um, you know, again, you know, like James kind of, I guess I'm talking in the context primarily of Western canons of art. So you know, appropriation being a kind of established artistic practice that, you know, many of in that in that kind of canon is kind of aligned to kind of sort of Duchamp's fountain as the kind of beginnings of that, I guess. Um, but in this image, the visual language, so such as the use of the impact font in a, in, a, in white with a black stroke um, is, appropri uh, is appropriated from those classic image macros. Um, whilst the imagery then is taken from, so we've got Unicode emojis in there, and then we've got the cat and dog taken from a young girl's t-shirt that I got from a high street retailer, um, as well as a drawing on there by my five-year-old. Um, and these are all combined in a way which kind of undercuts the seriousness of the message with a humorous twist, which is something common amongst internet memes. Um, but at the same time, speaking directly to that message, and so this kind of but, um, you know, it's, it's very much, I guess, a very formal collage, as we were talking about earlier on, we were talking about James's work. So it's kind of subverting the imagery and kind of, you know, in different ways, um, as they kind of brings them together and kind of makes new alignments between these different components. And next one, thank you. Um, so other works that are created to take a more direct approach. So again, kind of, this is another one using a kind of image macro format. Um, but it kind of is taken from a more serious sort of uh, a series of more political uh, pieces that are produced. Um, and you might have noticed, I, I don't know if you've got it from that last slide, but I've included the detail here. I mean, most of these works are um, physical artifacts. So typically the hand embroidered, um, appliqued or works of collage on paper. Um, so, so I'm kind of interested, so one of the other kind of things that interest me in the context of all this work I've been doing around the context of the internet more broadly over a period of time is understanding the way in which we assign value different across digital and physical spaces um, and the way in which the impact of these works changes when they're materialized through physical presences so like these ones for example have digital counterparts um, which kind of align to them so they kind of they kind of exist in those di digital and physical spaces 
across that space. Next one, please, Nada. So given the context of some recent events in the UK, um, as well as the context of this event, I thought it was worth showing some of the images of this work I produced, which uses the British monarchy as the, the crux of the content. Um, like certain corners of meme culture, the work frequently occupies an absurd position and often adopts a bit of a mischievous tone. Um, I got flamed when I shared some of this work online following the Queen's death recently, um, which is no surprise really. Um, you know, internet users are quick to jump down your throat without looking at the bigger picture. So I got accused, for example, of attention grabbing as if I hadn't been making these for a number of years. You know, these, aren't, these weren't made specifically in response to that kind of situation. Um, that said, you know, I, admittedly, I was reflecting at the time, just sort of game the algorithm, as it were, as we kind of sometimes do kind of in our social media uh, spaces. But um, obviously, sort of in the context of today's conversations around decolonization, the kind of images within them um, kind of obviously speak to those kind of big structures of power um, in the position within the UK, I guess, that have kind of reached out around the world. Next one, please, Nada. So, um, but some of the anti-monarchy work I made is grounded in my position as a Welsh artist. Uh, so, you know, sort of Nada's touched on this briefly. Um, you know, there are some, such as, as a, a Professor Martin Jones, in, based in Wales, has argued that Wales is a colony of England. Um, things are perhaps a bit more complicated than just asserting that in quite such a black and white manner. Um, but it is interesting to see how portions of the Welsh population see the relationship between England and Wales in this way. Um, so, for example, following the, the death of Queen Elizabeth and the ascendance of Prince Charles to the throne, if son William was given the title Prince of Wales. Um, and following this, there's been a petition in Wales which has gained significant response to have the Prince of Wales, Wales title ended, as it's seen by the, sort of certain parts of the Welsh population as a sign of that historical oppression of Wales by England. Um, in fact, the title has been held exclusively by English men since the 12th century when the last sort of true Prince of Wales was slain, as it were. So this kind of meme kind of talks to that kind of agenda, which is interesting. We've got our kind of own mini parliament within Wales. Um, and Nada and I were talking about this yesterday, and it's kind of interesting that, that it's, it's talked about as being devolved, devolved government, which kind of, you know, when you're kind of picking apart that word, this idea of de-evolution sort of suggests a sort of backward step in a way when you kind of, you know, it's interesting when you kind of think about that. Next one, please, Nada. So sorry for digressing a little Welsh history there, but bringing it back around to memes, it's um, and where they fit in, as I've always suggested, memes are sort of pervasive visual uh, artifacts. Um, and the visual content that many of them rely upon can sort of cross linguistic and national borders with great ease. And so whilst on one level, this ease of communication might be seen as a positive thing. Um, on the other, it can be used to reinforce, uh, reinforce negative stereotypes, racist assumptions about groups of people, um, such as in both these examples here. And given that many internet users see memes as little more than funny little JPEGs, this can make them quite pernicious little artifacts, really. Um, you know, people don't stop to question the issues of the content that they're viewing online they're quite a bit, and, you know, they, whether they're kind of viewing, liking or sharing them, you know, I say online, I'm kind of, sort of generalizing that, I guess I'm talking more specifically in the context of social media where these are typically shared. But, you know, the algorithms don't encourage critical thinking because that sort of requires time just to stop and think. And of course, that would eat into their profits. Um, there we go. Next one. Yes. So, as we mentioned, memes are based on appropriation. Uh, they're based on the art of the remix, uh, taking something, recontextualizing it, and sending it out its way again. There's lots of links here to the way in which James was talking about collage earlier, as I've already said. Um, and that's perhaps why. I find myself using collage-based approaches in my own practice. Um, and within memes, it's often based on an incongruous juxtaposition, juxtaposition of elements to kind of create the kind of, some kind of humorous element, um, whether that's photos and text, video or sound. Um, and often in ways that the reappropriation can make the images seem naturally at home in the new context in the way that they're kind of forced back into these new, new uh, opportunities to make meaning. Um, so in the case of culture jamming activities where images are appropriated from the capitalist and consumer systems that bind us and then they can be appropriated as a means to challenge these systems. 
we might see this as positive activism, but of course, you know, going back to those previous two, you know, when, when folks share memes that are perhaps racist or misogynistic or however it may be, they serve to reinforce those systems of power and oppression. So that's kind of a, a, a brief, oh, um, a brief overview of internet memes in a very close nutshell. As I say, we sort of teach a module on this and spend sort of four hours a week going over this. <laughs> there's, there's a big deep rabbit hole we could go down, but it's got, hopefully it's a bit of a useful bit of context for what it is we're trying to do this um, in this session. Um, yeah, so this this session that we um, sorry next slide there I feel like the um, the um, the session that we've got here is kind of based on a session that Nard and I co-taught with some second year undergrad students last year um, in which we sort of uh, Nada was teaching a module in which she was teaching the ideas around decolonization um, alongside my module was teaching kind of, sort of delving into meme studies so it was kind of uh, we, we sort of brought though both those the students from both those groups together to, to attempt to decolonize memes if you like in a way kind of um to kind of remix them redesign them to kind of nullify um the potential negative impact that they might have um in the, in the way that they're kind of presented um you know that kind of way that they kind of the, the inherent jokes that are kind of within them um are nullified i guess just to kind of what happens when we do that and i think when we started doing this um it was really interesting to see the students reaction wasn't it they didn't you know we consume memes constantly like you said and we just flick past them we don't even really look into the like the meaning the context like really delve into everything about a meme and it's 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 such a clever way of communicating and um it was really interesting when we started stripping them back how how shocked people were that they were consuming a lot of this um you know especially from a, you know it was quite a interesting perspective from the students yeah yeah and talking to the students about it it's kind of you know one of the things i asked them to do is kind of you know the, the notion of what a meme is is open to some debates in a sense so i asked them to try and define what they understand a meme to be and like quite like both last year and this year they, they both come at it with uh, oh a meme is funny it has to be funny mm. um you know but when you kind of pitch the idea of humor as being relative is you can't you can't hold up that argument that humor is an inherent factor in a meme you know this is not what makes a meme because what's funny yeah. for one would be funny for another and just because it's not funny to me or you doesn't mean it's, mean, it's not a meme um, but it's that kind of humor that's kind of inherent across them that becomes dangerous then yeah and it's also that yeah it's almost like the given standard or or of that one type of humor is expected to be funny for everyone which is what we're gonna kind of delve into but also I think things like performative fashion and um fashion to me is definitely a, a really strong meme you know especially the way that memes have evolved from almost like a still image to like the one we've just seen now um it's a constant performance um even you have statement tees you know statement t-shirts which are like walking memes really um and they kind of transform the person wearing them into this walking, talking meme, if you will. Uh, like, so I, I think I wrote in the chat about Kanye West's recent fashion show. There's still images from that almost looked like the T-shirts from that show. It almost looked like someone had edited, edited them and made a meme, if you get what I mean. The way the font was placed on the T-shirts, um, the fact that it was Kanye West it looked like an altered image to make it to get that kind of effect but unfortunately it wasn't it was just his t-shirt but yeah right shall i stop sharing and yeah can do do you want to explain what we're going to attempt to do 
<laughs> right. Well, okay. I'll try and explain. Then you can just kind of barge in when you yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I lose um, my train of thought. So, um, but just to let you know, like some of the memes, um, memes are not always non-offensive. Some of the memes might be offensive to some people, and um, that is not why we are showing them. the The whole point of this workshop that we're going to do, which we will be editing and decolonizing these memes together live in this document um which we will share in the chat the whole aim behind this is that we are trying to understand the memes understand the context and then almost rectify them if you will and then see the message that is delivered um and it will take us back to that conversation about humor and i think a lot of that links in with fashion not just because of that idea of that decolonizing process, but also that can be adapted to fashion, but also the idea of appropriating an offense and how sometimes in fashion, especially when you appropriate something, whether you find it humorous or not, or whether you find it um, pleasing to wear that thing, it can create great offense when you don't know the context of it. I think I see it. That's the most simple way I can put it. Um, in terms of fashion, really, if you want to add to that, Spike. I think that sort of covers it in a nutshell, I guess. Yeah. yeah it's, it's kind of trying to just understand, I guess, understand those systems that are play in that communication to understand how we kind of think about that, isn't it? It's the... Yeah. And we will hopefully get you all to participate in, in stripping back these memes. We'll be doing it together. People can add things in the chat if they don't know how to edit them themselves. Um, I mean, possibly, should we start off doing, like looking at one meme and then editing it live, Spike, and then maybe everyone else can join in and add some suggestions? Yeah, I can do. You could share the screen and, I mean, there's there's not too many participants here, so maybe you could just share the screen and edit it based on suggestions. And it will be interesting to have those conversations about what it is that's, potentially problematic about I mean they're fair, I think it's fairly clear what's problematic about each of the images but I mean you know it's it's a provocation it's kind of opening up a conversation around that isn't it and it's like if we're attempting to decolonize things then um there has to be room for difficult conversations you can't shy away from these things you know and hence I think now there's a big content warning flash there yeah so the image in, is in here are, are quite likely to cause offence to someone. I don't know whether that someone might be in the room. It's that kind of, you know, depends on where we come from. There's a, there's a few different ones in here. Yeah. Um, and um, But I think, like you said, it's that sometimes some of us have to, we have to have those difficult conversations, don't we? And that's the beauty of coming together and collaborating and dealing with these things. Because these things are out there. We're not, we're not stopping them by ignoring them but we can at least try and, and address them and rectify them and then hopefully take that practice of almost rectifying collage and rectifying memes, decolonizing them, we can take it into other areas. So let's start off with our first one. Yeah, so I think you can all see that. So if we were to edit this, let's strip it back and let's start, an, you know. I always find the fonts very, like it's the same font mo for most memes and I find it like who picked that like where did that start I don't know you might you might know Spike I don't know but I, I think your suggestion that it's the same font for all memes just to tell me don't look at enough memes <laughs> <laughs> but yes the impact font is a common font with memes because it was part of a number of prepackaged fonts in the earlier days of the internet and computers it was just accessible and it, so it was one of the boldest fonts available yeah, yeah, I think that that must be it because I always look at them and be like, oh, why? Why would you pick that font? It's yeah, but now we know. Right, you can start us off with this process. Um, I'm just trying to think if we. I have to go out of presenter mode. I think. So sharing mode, yeah. yeah, so I think we can move things around now. Well, it's just an image, so you'll need to add shapes over the top. Yeah, we'll add. Top, yeah, and then you can add text over the top of that. Yeah. Right. Well, you should be able to do this anyway while we're while I'm screen sharing, shouldn't you? So 
yeah. we can do it together. So suggestions, obviously it's quite, I mean, it's quite obvious to me what would be offensive here, um, but how could we then strip that back? I don't know if we have any examples from the workshop we had about modifications done to this meme. Well, I guess there's different way. I mean, it's, it's I'm picking the content, isn't it, to see what you'd change about it. It's kind of like, you know, whether you'd and where the what causes offence. It's kind of the components you've got here are your, your text and image, putting it very simply. Um, it depends how far you want to go dissecting that. Can, um, can I ask a question, um, Nada? Yes. Um, I, I personally am not very familiar with memes. I don't know. I guess there are a lot on social media, probably, where I don't spend a whole lot of time. But um, I guess the bottom line of a meme is that it's funny, right? Or not? Or am I? That's, that's the. the... <sighs> That would probably be the mainstream view, yeah. It's not okay, the be all so and end all. Not. They're, they're, not, they're not all funny. And so are, are um, there but yes, to be the, the, vast, the, vast majority, the vast majority work on the basis of a kind of a joke with a punchline. Um, yeah. Because they're funny based on, on stereotypes, on, on prejudices, on right? So, no, I'm just trying to think like if we would start yeah. editing it now. Um, it's still supposed to be funny or not? Because I'm just wondering if you take out the so-called funny bit based on stereotypes, you know, Arabs or oh, terrorists, blasts. If we start taking that out, is it then still a meme? Or, you know? I, 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 I would argue that regardless of whether it's funny or not, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the, a meme... So if you go back to the light, so there's, there's sort of key theorists in terms of memes would be sort of Limor Schiffman and Ryan Milner who kind of talk about memes as being um, these kind of uh, remixed artifacts, you know, kind of, um, so it's that idea that they kind of, they share common elements, um, you know, so whether it's the image, whether, whether it's certain bits, memetic phrases, um, but they're kind of everybody tweaks them to communicate something that's kind of perhaps more individual to them or, or perhaps more specific to their individual situation so it may be that in in the context of editing these now to kind of perhaps to try and nullify the offense in this one for example but yes we might lose the humor and it might be the case that we're saying well that it might be like, yeah so okay de decolonizing the world isn't going to be funny <laughs> You know, it's like you know, there, there are things like that we might have to challenge. So, so yeah, it wouldn't be a case that you know the, the challenge wouldn't necessarily be to edit this and it still be funny. No, the challenge would I, be. I'm almost tempted to say we should just get rid of it, <laughs> but that's not the <laughs> point of the. Of but, then, no, but, then, um, but I guess, but I guess the point is you can't get rid of it if, if this thing exists. It's kind of that's my point with them being pervasive. It's like there's no there's no way, you know, you can't these things exist in the world even if we deleted this now we've seen it you know it, the image exists we can call it forth in our minds we know it's it's been there so the so damage is the damage the mean... damage is done by the fact it's been presented to someone somewhere yeah so the editing would be <clears throat> that you kind of like comment on it in the comment section or something like if you see this on social media you could edit it by by commenting on it and and, and in that sense rectifying or decolonizing it is that is that i know no, we're talking about literally editing it right now like yeah yeah, yeah i know but yeah. how would you do that if it's out there if it's what you would do what you would do you would participating in that memetic, memetic practice would be doing what we're doing and then be sharing those images back online yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's rectifying them and then resharing, if you will. So our, what our students did is that they went, they did the research surrounding a bunch of images. So we haven't made these memes. These are out there and they're very viral. Like um, they're actually, you know, they're some of the first things that come up in a search. If you type in something as simple as Arab memes, you know, they're not of our own making. And the fact that they're out there and at some point they were used quite commonly and people laugh about them, that's where the issue lies. Um, it's that almost taking bits of a culture and then repurposing them for, for that relevant, you know, 
subjective humor, if you will. So the idea is, is they, they don't have to be funny, but they should at least be correct. And that's how you kind of fight back in that the correct version isn't funny because what you, that again, this feeds into that false narrative that is given of this, the terrorist, all of these oriental colonial, you know, um, imagery that we've been fed for hundreds of years has led to the meme. So the meme essentially is just another form of orientalist art, if you will. It's just an evol evolved digital um, false narrative and fa false propaganda, which creates these stereotypes. So for me, I mean, I would edit it now, but I think if I try to move from, because I'm sharing my screen, but for me, the first thing I would do is, for example, maybe not even edit the test, the, the text, but just get a really amazing lavish picture of an Arab wedding and put that there because they are a blast. I mean, to be honest, Arab Muslim weddings are great fun and they are very extravagant, the ones I've been to. So it might be something as simple as, you know, um, changing the image, or it could be something as simple as they, they always have great food, which is quite, you know, literal in the sense of what we are doing. And then you put that out there. Oh yeah, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> And then as soon as you change that image, see how the meaning changes? It's instantaneous. This is no longer offensive. It's, it's, a, it's an image of a wedding. Why Muslim weddings so fun? They're always a blast. It takes away the meaning completely. And I think this practice just shows you how you take things out of context and how you take them away from their culture of origin really disrupts and almost makes the message so much more ambiguous. And we do this constantly in fashion. We take bits and motives from different cultures and we juxtapose them on a Western silhouette or on a non kind of appropriate silhouette and it's given out to the masses. So this is where the connection is, is that how do we rectify this? We use methods from art from different disciplines to kind of rectify and decolonize fashion sorry i went off on a bit of a tangent but yes see now this to me is not offensive i don't know if it's offensive to anyone else but this looks like a pretty nice wedding nada i wonder if um just on on angela's query questioning around um 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 humor um and this question of like you know at, in each of these, like whose humor is it? Like, like who is it, who is it humorous for? So the question of humor, it's amusing and interesting for whom? So so it's the you know the and so yeah, the 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 deeply damaging work of and that's the kind of colonial the yeah, colonialism just continues in the um, because it it reproduces the same kinds of violences, um, and so what you're doing or suggesting to do with with decolonizing the meme is is almost also what what all that decolonial aesthesis is is you know understanding its coloniality um, because that's what you what you're kind of pointing to um, and and offering alternatives. So the work is in creating the alternatives that can that can counter or like yeah yeah I think people don't realize that their humor is offensive because like you said it is it is targeted mm -hmm. at a western kind of colonial humor it is not targeted for the global south it is not memes uh you know predominantly we do have memes now that are in Arabic for example um but they're even they're even you know um the humor is targeting each country's own people, which I find bizarre. Whereas a lot of Western memes target other, the other, if you will. So mm -hmm. yeah, what we are trying to do, it's almost confront people with what they found funny. Because when you take the humor away, you realize what was wrong with the meme. It's almost that, there's that instant, oh. Um, and although everyone in this space, I feel, understands why they're damaging and why they are um, really awful and why these memes in particular are offensive. A lot of people don't, even our students, you know, we find them really kind of grappling with the fact that 
they really did find it funny. And then when they realize how bad it is, when you change the imagery, or when you change the text, when they're confronted with their own kind of um, sense of humor and their own impact or their own taking part in stereotyping and racial profiling and, and, and colonialism, they really take a step back and realize um, that this is wrong, if you will, or, you know, there's a need to change it. Hence why, you know, it's something as simple as taking that relative humor out. It, it makes me think of this, this national like campaign in the Netherlands, like they had billboards all over saying my culture is not a joke. Um, and, and one of the aspects was like my, my attire is not a costume. You know, whether it was like, um, you know, when people dress up, I don't know, like Native Americans or like, you know, you have all these sets of costumes, even for children. Um, so it's it's the mi microaggressions probably that you're also kind of like referring to where people then go like, yeah, but I didn't mean it, you know, in an offensive way or it was just a joke. You usually get that answer a lot. It was just a joke. So, I mean it's yeah probably as you say creating awareness how people think they are being innocent whereas they're not and i guess that's maybe the same for memes where they will go like yeah but it's innocent but in a matter of fact it's not it's not and it's the widespread of them as well it's the sheer volume of them i mean not just to do with arabs or muslims or you know, in general, it's it most of the time it's targeting the other. So it is targeting the ones colonized. So decolonizing the meme is, is a huge undertaking. I mean, we're not going to do it in one night or in a year or in two, but it is a huge undertaking because the, the whole idea of a meme is that it is viral. And by viral, it means it is seen by people all over the world. It spreads. And the fact that you've seen it, like Spike said, you can't unsee it. You've seen it now. So it's done its job in that it's communicated the dark humor that it wanted to communicate. So how do we rectify that? Yeah, I don't think, and I don't think it's a case of actually saying we can decolonize the meme, right? that we can undo this. It's more about awareness and kind of being able to have those conversations who benefit from the privilege of those colonial systems. You know, going back to kind of what we're just uh, sort of remembering last year when we ran this with some students, we had we had a, uh, memes like this one we've just had up on the screen in there. And we had some Egyptian students in the group um, and some um, students from Muslim backgrounds. And then we had some kind of uh, white British students in the group. And it was kind of really interesting, the dynamic that started to develop in the sense that you had the kind of the white British students were, who, were, who were kind of like, oh, well, there was a really awkwardness in them in that sense of they were kind of like, well, I can see how it, I can see how this would be funny, you know, and it was, it was really, you know, you, you could sort of tell by the language was all at least, yes, they saw it was funny. They just didn't want to admit they saw it was funny. It was really, you know, a couple of them did eventually when we sort of teased that out. But at the same time, you had those uh, students from the Muslim backgrounds who were just like, no, it's not funny. It's, it's not funny. It's just, that was their base, you know, and it's, when you're able to bring those people together, have those conversations and start, you know that that's when you can kind of get to the nub of some of these conversations we need to be having at the heart of this so like the next one for example i think this was actually done in an attempt to almost rectify a beam but then it it didn't do itself any favors either did it it just well, it fed into another stereotype, a different stereotype, but still another stereotype or another image of, of something that's, you know, that's put out there in the world. Like Arabs are extremely rich or something or? Yeah, like they're, yeah, they're really yeah, rich and they're, rich. and they're riding around in the desert with their four by fours, which is something that then has come up in music videos numerous times, Hollywood, you know, you've got these two images that it's almost like they're either terrorists or they're very rich, but still barbaric in that they don't know how to spend their money because they have so much of it, you know, through films like Syriana, for example, even um, Sex and City 2 when they were in Dubai, that idea that they are 
rich, they have everything that is high end, high end fashion, high end cars, everything, but they're still in the middle of the desert. So I think what this tried to do was try to kind of rectify the narrative, but instead it, it didn't, it just fed into a different stereotype. So I mean, to rectify this, I would probably try and put down, I don't know, pictures of, like off the top of my head, I would try and- The alphabet. Yeah. In the alphabet, introducing, what is it, the stars? What is that called again? Astrology. Astrology. Method, introducing into uh, mathematics. Um, well, I think I would put down, um, possibly pictures of famous, you know, Nobel Prize women, you know, um, Abu Sina, like all of these, yeah, the philosophers, the, you know, the amazing mathematicians, all of these people in under what they really do. I mean, that would have been my choice to rectify it. But that's- right, Some of the designers, uh, Azdin uh, Alaya. Yes. So, I mean, even if you, you could change that in a context of fashion, which I've seen before, which is, um, how Arabs, you know, how people think Arabs dress and how they really dress. And again, that was done, I couldn't find it, but that was done in a very, it was, you know, the burqa. And then you had the shot from the clip from Sex and the City 2, where they take off their burqa and it's all Gucci, Versace. And it's like, well, we have such a rich um, culture and we have such a strong kind of archive of all these fabulous designers that we could have used, you know, we could have used any number of these, but they chose to go for that um, Western film image to, to show showcase Arabic fashion, you know. So yeah, there's different, there's definitely things we can do with this to rectify there's, it. There's, there's an interesting thing that happens with some humor like this, where by in trying to kind of put the things in a more positive spin, you end up reinforcing those stereotypes so there's the successful black man meme is a kind of really good example of this and kind of yeah has a picture there's a, there's a stock character macro so it's kind of like this they all use this kind of picture of a black man you know, in a sort of pinwheel um and the, the the you know it's set up in a kind of classic joke format with a opening and then a punchline so the opening would be is very much like that previous one we saw about the weddings so it would say something like uh you know I walked out on my family this morning across the top and then at the bottom it would have something like to go to my high powered job in the city so it's kind of it you know it's kind of saying yes black men can go and get good jobs in the city and kind of live that capitalist dream if you like um, but at the same time it's reinforcing the, the whole premise of the joke is based on those stereotypes we have in the first place um and I think, I, I guess that's interesting relative to what perhaps we're trying to do in this space in sort of decolonizing and it pushes you to think about kind of being critically aware of what you're doing when you're trying to do good and trying to help, but we're not inadvertently uh, reinforcing ideals and stereotypes um, that are problematic in that. Kind of, you know, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? Kind of being so self-aware. Oh, and then, right, this is, sorry, I haven't got my glasses on, so I'm going to take a minute to read it. Um, it says what liberals think we do and what socialists think we do and what nationalists think we do and what our friends think we do and what we think we do. And what we actually, actually do. do. Yeah. And it says the Royal Forums, that's the website. What we think we do. Yeah. So I, mean, I think there's been um for just to contextualize as well, everything. I think Spike showed some of his work that he'd done prior to the Queen's passing, but there's a very clear divide in monarchists and kind of anti-monarchists, if you will, in the UK. Um and that became a lot more evident when um, the Queen passed away because obviously there was that period of mourning. There were people who wanted to travel to London and stay awake and stay in a queue for over 24 hours to see a, a coffin. Um, 
and other people who were very against it and very against this idea that we should be mourning as a nation. I did put a statement out um, for our collective kind of um, uh, on Instagram and Facebook and I had to take it down because I got so many offensive comments and, you know, um, things ranging from why do you live in this country, even though I was born in the UK, um, to uh, you should be ashamed of yourself and give up your British passport. Um, and, and the comment I did write was nothing offensive to that degree. I just simply said that we need to acknowledge that um, she was a very successful woman in power and she was a mother and she was a grandmother but at the same time, you know, which we are very sad about, but at the same time, she was part of a 70 year kind of colonial structure and she took part in that very actively. So this is quite an interesting meme for, for the present, but I think it's quite, it's older than that, isn't it? It's, it's a bit of an old one. Yeah, it's not a recent one. This one. So how, how would we need to decolonize this is to make like the coloniality of monarchies visible, for example? I don't know what the, because it's a bit hard to see, but what nationalists think we do, does it have like, I don't know, some sort of like the land map behind that person? I, I couldn't identify that person either, but it's probably a colonist or a, I don't know who that person is, or is that a king or something? or is it Leopold, the Belgian king? <laughs> Who is he? Austrian Kaiser or something? So he... what we usually do is actually start off by, by asking these questions and then going and looking for these images and trying to find out who these people are. So sometimes there's obscure people and memes, but sometimes, like, like you've noticed now, there's someone who looks like he's relatively important or well known so what we would do is we would go and look for you know who is this person what is this map what is it symbolizing etc to start with but yeah I think I mean I would personally change it to the reality of a monarchy but I don't know Spike do you have any thoughts on this I mean what's the interesting one isn't it in the context of it is referring to it's, it's, all, it's directly, I mean, this one's targeting monarchists who are kind of followers of those structures of power. <laughs> so, I mean, I think this is, you know, you could actually can spend an hour just pulling this one apart to try and understand how you'd reframe it, really, in the context of that, you know, decolonial practices. I was going to say something. Hmm. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say something that I think, I think not being part of that system, which is the British monarchy, but sort of aware of it on the periphery um, um, as an ex-British colony, I suppose, um, I should pay attention to it or I could have paid attention. But um, my first response was I, I saw the title monarchist, but I couldn't really kind of make out all the images either. And then I thought of the monarch butterfly. You know, I'm sort of thinking, well, you know, to take it completely away from this, like, mm. this, nice this, this, this people, yeah. this people centric, I mean, in a way, um, memes also keep bringing the attention back to this kind of celebrity focus. So like, actually, you know, shifting, shifting, um, the fo anyway, it's not humorous. So I, then I thought, well, maybe that's not, I mean, it, so yeah, I suppose it's a bit of a grapple, but but to undermine the power of that as a me. Could uh, you could put that butterfly and say, stop abusing my reputation or something. <laughs> <laughs> stop I really, appropriating I, my <laughs> reputation or... <laughs> I mean, I really, I really like that take. And it kind of it taps into my kind of tough sensibilities when I'm sort of talking about Dada and Fox's approaches to art and kind of that sort of surreal bent in it. Like, I mean, the memes we're looking at here are very much in this kind of mainstream view of what a meme is and the kind of the joke formats. If you kind of go down the rabbit hole, things do get more weird and wonderful and less people centric. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
mm. might be. No, it's, 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 a, it's a really nice take on it, that kind of decentering the humans from these is perhaps the only way to kind of tackle it, <laughs> the, the, those structures in it. You know, yeah. But we could say like what we think we do is perpetuating colonialism, for example, is keeping those power structures going. But also, mm. um, you know, where you regularly get to see the number of like, uh, if you would put it in money, how much the monarchies in the world owe former colonies, you know, in money, like Australia has it keeps count. Uh, I know, I think Jamaica keeps count. So, you know, and those are really like trillions of dollars <laughs> that they owe them by now. So there could be another one. Well, I think, yeah, I, I think that's actually a really, I mean, we could even change the tax. So it could be, you know, what we think we owe, what we do owe in terms of, instead of monarchies, just the monarchies, um, like you said, which is a really interesting, actually, it, it's a completely different view then, isn't it? Um, you know, even for the nation, nationalists, it could be, you know, what, what we think we colonize, for example. Um, because there is that, yeah, oh wait, we've got something coming in here, yeah. A butterfly. <laughs> and what we actually do is, is yeah, create chaos. So um, yeah, there's a lot we could do with this. So think of, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be changing the, the wording. It could be something as simple as changing the imagery. It could be changing the whole thing, really. Um, this one I think is the least offensive, but, You'd be surprised how offensive, how offended, you know, monarchists could get from this. Exactly. You don't consider it offensive because you're not a, a considered or you don't a see yourself as a monarchist, but I'm sure that all those people yeah. standing in line for days and days and days just to see a piece of wood, uh, trust me, they'll be offended. Yeah, they'll be very offended. Yeah. I would I would say that in itself was a meme. Yes. <laughs> the cube. <laughs> Well, the, I think there were a few made from it as well, like the queue that was, you know, a few things about, you know, the economy. I can't remember the exact wording, but yeah. Now, um, the next meme was based on, I'll give you some context for it, because um, it's based on uh, something one of the Azhar sheikhs had said on TV. Um, and it was taken as quite an extremist kind of um, view. Well, I think someone's still editing this, which is quite lovely, so we'll let them carry on. Um, but then this meme took off, not so much made by, I think, the West. It was actually made by possibly Egyptians, Arabs. It was made by Muslims, and then it became viral started off with the absolutely haram meme and then it got turned into these other memes. So mm -hmm. it just shows you how one image can then trigger so many other images. So if you type in even in Google, absolutely haram, the amount of things that come up with this sheikh's face on with absolutely haram written on um, is, is infinite. Um, some of them are more offensive than others. Some of them are actually made by Arabs or Muslims, and some of them are made by Western society mocking Arabs and Muslims. So it, it's quite a minefield, you know, the, the next one we're gonna go into, but. So we've got someone, someone's editing with us. I think that's not you, Spike, is it? No, it's not me. Okay, so that's quite nice. So I quite like it when other people kind of take part. So what we think we do is, yeah, giving a gift to the nation with our monarchist views. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's me. I thought, I, Bianca, I thought it's about this kind of like that you do something nice for the people. So I was looking for a picture where a crowd gets a gift or something and they I'm not so it, it's it's not so quickly done <laughs> it's, <laughs> no it's not it's really difficult yeah. to find imagery that's what but if you yeah. think of then how long it's taken these people to make one meme that 
you know, it's, it's quite a laborious task. It's not easy. So the next one, as I was saying, has to do with the sheikh on the right. Um, uh, but please continue editing it. This is brilliant. Uh, has to do with the sheikh on the right um, speaking uh, about multiple issues, but he was classed as quite extremist in his views. Um, and he's an Egyptian sheikh from the Azhar. And then this absolutely haram meme started coming out, which is, so that's him with the absolutely haram meme came out. And then it was countered by absolutely halal. So these two together were separate memes. And then people started adapting them and creating different storylines or different kind of, you know, um, what they see as humorous, if you will. Now, a lot of them were made not by Western um, meme makers, they were made by Arab Muslim meme makers. And it was almost that, again, like I said, I noticed this pattern of um, like, like almost that self orientalizing I think that we've spoken about before um, in making of the memes. So when you look at Arabic memes or memes that stem from, for example, North Africa or from uh, a Muslim nation, a lot of the time they're self-mocking and I don't know if that is almost like we're going to beat um, we're going to beat them to it like almost like we're going to mock ourselves so no one else can um, or it's some kind of defense mechanism but it seems to be a consistent pattern of it's almost like living up to that stereotype in a way which I find quite disturbing but it does fit in with that self-orientalizing pattern Um, Nada, I'm, I'm just going to um, add something about humor as a kind of tool, um, a, a political tool. I mean, in South Africa, it's quite, it has been used as a kind of political tool to kind of undermine, um, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm, it definitely, it definitely exists as a kind of practice of disruption like the the um um the slipperiness of something you think you know me you think you know me i'm more dangerous than than i mean it, it, it's something about ownership or 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 yeah so i think there is something in there um that isn't just about self-orientalizing but it's something um yeah, there's something there. And and I don't think um, Ica specifically meant it in the same way, but she spoke about in um, Kazakhstan, she spoke about humor as also a, a means of kind of surviving the radical um, challenges that Kazakh people have had over the last 300 years or 500 years, she, she kind of spoke about a, a period of time and how humor as a kind of tool, a, survive, a tool for survival. Anyway, but I don't, I, I'm not saying that the meme is something there, but I, I do think that there is something um, beyond just um, self orientalizing. Yeah, no, that's true. That's just, I think like there was something about it that seemed quite almost like. Uh, a protection like a defense mechanism like almost like well it's okay if I make fun of myself then it's okay no one else can do it you know or it, it, there was a bit of that um almost yeah reclaiming the humor so Spike just put in the chat humor and politics post meme seizing the memes of production uh, it's a pdf mm. so um but yeah there was something about that um that seemed like a pattern to me then the more and more I looked into it the more it became evident especially the um for example the Egyptian accounts that only produced Egyptian memes or Arab memes and it was something that was like oh I'm gonna it's self-mockery to protect myself or to make it okay almost to dilute the power of it if you will um so it's, it's almost like when comedians make fun of themselves so it's well no if I do it to myself then it's you know no one else is going to have that power over me um 
But I mean, to modify this would be super easy, you know, for absolutely haram, I'd even just do something like food or alcohol for the image. And then for absolutely halal, I would do something like, you know, um, an image of, you know, halal food, if it was food we were going down, something super simple. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people found it quite entertaining. It was used repetitively and it was used as a couple together, like the absolutely haram and absolutely halal, but it was also then used separately and it became quite viral. I mean, they're still around. They're quite recent, I think, these ones. But yeah, I'm just, um, I'm just cautious of the time and I really like that, um, I think Bianca was editing the memes, but I mean, there's one that I got sent, um, which I really wanted to show you guys. Um, and it's because it's someone I know uh, who was explaining to me, um, this person doesn't look uh, Egyptian and you know doesn't look uh, half Jordanian, half Egyptian. And when she walked into her new work, um, she said people just assumed she was, um, you know, white British. And then she sent me this meme, which was quite entertaining for, for you know, to explain her point, which was how people view me. And this is quite this innocent figure. And then how people view me after I tell them I'm Arab. And she said that the mood in the office changed dramatically when they found out that she was Arab. And this was a couple of years ago, but it was a meme that was sent to me and I found it um yeah I found it very to the point but it was quite self-expressive as well but we'll go back to the meme about that as well but... I don't know Spike if you want to add to that or how anyone... would we edit this then because that's the true story for someone like as sad as it is would we be able to edit it? Well, that's or maybe really... then turn around this one as in like the Mary Virgin or Mother Teresa or somebody like super good for the. But or... actually, like you said, I mean, that's a really valid point. Do we need to edit it? Because it's quite true. It's sad, but true. So for me, I mean, I think it's, it's a very, um, to the point way of expressing how uh, probably a lot of people feel in their workplaces, especially. Um, we put Muhammad Ali here. Yeah, you could. And you could even put, it could even be how people view me after I tell them I'm Arab. I mean, the, the view I get is very different. It's more of that kind of, you know, Aladdin, Jasmine, exotic fetish, fetishization. So yeah. <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> yeah it could be like that that automatically neutralizes anything doesn't it it could and it could work for anything how people view me and how people view me after I tell them I'm whatever it is vegan anywhere from anywhere anything that would work but yeah, it could be something that's quite empowering. But um, this one in particular is a really interesting one because like, as you said, Angela, do you need to change it? Because it's quite truthful and it's sad, but true. Yeah. That's also an interesting thing. Well, and the thing is, yeah, if you put something positive there, yeah, virtually it's not true or in a sense, like that's not how she's experiencing it. Yeah. I think she but, but I think I think putting this image there um actually confronts the inner stereotype that one carries because you kind of how people view me and how people view me after I tell them I'm Arab and then it's like but they're like showing that they're friends like and then it it kind of it still carries that 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 sting because you kind of sort of think well I did, you know, did I do I actually have another way of thinking about how I would? So it's the kind of silence. It's what what isn't spoken there. So it's it's still I think quite a powerful, um, you know, replacing it with that image of a friendship. Yeah, it still carries the punch of the of the of the meme, 
because you kind of counts from, you you kind of saying it's opposite because it's the unexpected. Yeah, I, yeah, I like that as well. The idea that it's um, a way, and I think Spike, did you just delete it altogether? How people view me? Yeah, and then <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> how people view me. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think yeah, I think there's that element, isn't there, that you expect. Oh, that's not what I expected. Oh, friends, I was kind of expecting, hmm, you know, the dude with the beard. Um, but yeah, that that's that's brilliant. That's my favorite one now. How people view me, and that's it, full stop. <laughs> Just oh, it's a little little boy caricature. <laughs> that's, that's how I'm viewed. Right. And then this one came up. I think was this when we were looking for Orientalist memes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this came up. We, I mean, I remember typing, we typed in like Orientalism and memes or Orientalist memes, and we got a lot um, back. But this was one of them. And yeah, I mean, we, we present, I'm sure we presented this one to the class as well. I think Spike is fading all his. Yeah. <laughs> Are yeah, you okay? We used, to, we, we used this one last year with students. This was when we used them, yeah. Yeah. I can't remember how they changed it, though, to be honest. I'm just trying to find it now. Mm. I am aware of the time, um, and I think we were going to try and mm -hmm. wrap up. Um, by um with a kind of sort of collective kind of sharing counts at the end of the day um and I, I I'm, I'm not sure I mean it might just be that you wanted about an hour I'm not sure Mandy sort of said there might be like an hour at the end of of this I think uh, um yeah, we. I think we were supposed to have a, a sharing council for all three, but uh, it seems that James and uh, Zainab on here, are they? Here. Yeah, so they've had to leave. Um, but this has been really interesting, and um, I was actually just uh, thinking of a question about, you know, if we were to do this in the context of fashion. Yeah. This kind of like decolonizing the meme, but in the way of fashion like how could that look like well so I don't I mean from my perspective I was saying like I find fashion imagery very mimetic if you will in the way it in the way it works you know especially the images that go viral it functions as a meme it, it communicates almost as a meme. it replicates and it passes on these kind of inside jokes you know that that if you're in the know, then you'll know what it means. So there's a lot of things to do with memes. Like if you're from that culture or if you're from that country, then you'll appreciate the humor of that meme. It's the same with fashion in terms of if you're from that place, you'll appreciate the origin or you'll appreciate the aesthetic or you'll understand how something is misplaced. So if we can adapt that being informed about where everything is coming from and not just placing bits on top of each other, almost not just collaging fashion in a weird way, um, but looking at the origins of where everything's coming from, then we can almost try and start to apply the same practice to fashion. And like I mentioned Kanye West's t-shirt, which was very offensive to very many people, which was in the last fashion week. But that image of him wearing the T-shirt in itself has become a meme. So you do get a lot of imagery from fashion that becomes a meme. You know, even this like, oh, I woke up in the morning. I didn't realize this was going to happen to me. And it's an image from a catwalk with something that's exaggerated, like exaggerated hair or makeup or, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so fashion's also commentated. It's kind of that social commentary is used in fashion but also about fashion so how do we kind of yeah it's a really good question how do we harness that power of the meme almost but put it to good use you know in a fashion context yeah absolutely and um 
I was thinking about that collection. I think it was like maybe six, seven years ago. I can't remember the designer now who did those like big tulle dresses with the big text writing on it. And it was... Uh... It was Victor and Rolf. I'm not Victor, Victor and Rolf. Rolf. Yeah. So it Victor was Victor and Rolf. Rolf. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and... Uh, it, they had some, they had quite a lot of, I felt like it was quite a meme sort of text as well. Um, but I remember at the time thinking myself just that like, you know, is, uh, you know, have we really reached this place of fashion where, I don't know, it, it felt quite um, just, uh, yeah, mimetic. Like it didn't, uh, it didn't feel like high fashion anymore. It felt like we were making fun of ourselves now. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. If anybody wants to add. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, even when we started having t-shirts like the statement tea, but then you had a t-shirt that said white t-shirt. And things to me that functions like a meme, like you said, it's almost like really not so much. I mean, I don't even know if they intended it as making fun of the industry, but it did come off that way. And again, that item of you know that thing of humor comes into you know into play in that it comes off as something humorous, so therefore it acts like a meme. So I think that misconception around what an actual definition or what an actual meme is. Um, but there the problem also is, I don't know who was putting in that definition where you then kind of like erase the incredible violence of, of, of such an industry because yeah, it's funny that you make fun of yourself or whatever as an industry. But then again, you know, it is an incredibly serious industry in the sense of the violence and the abuse and, and the pollution mm. and, and the you name it. You know, but isn't also that uh, like uh, what is it the brand I think Balenciaga or something who continue yeah. constantly uh, mocks uh, very daily wear or whatever like brands or and then turns the DHL and like then, the DHL and, and mm -hmm. then asks incredible high amounts of money for things that are I think the last thing and the IKEA bag. Mm. Yeah, but also and like with very dirty jeans or like very yeah. completely run down sneakers and, and then asking, I don't know how many thousands of euros. I mean, the, the latest one, wasn't it? The Lay's bag, Lay's crisps mm. bag, yeah. which was ridiculously expensive. And Ashish, who's a, who's a British based designer, when he now this is again, I find another form of mimetic kind of you know, fashion, if you will. Um, he wore a T-shirt that said immigrant on, and it was to deal with protesting, you know, the treatment of immigrants um, in the UK. But also, yes, yeah, I am my own muse. And, um, but he also uh, created these sequin Tesco bags. And that was to do um, with the idea that these plastic bags are found in India and Egypt and all over the world. Um, and it was more around that whole collection was more to do with the fact of how damaging, like you said, fashion is and but that it has a voice and it should be used um, instead of just making money in a way. So his whole collection was based around that. So it was the same idea of using a mundane object and making it into a high fashion item, but the reasoning, the intent behind it was very different. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. But then when he wore that t-shirt that said immigrant on, that turned into a meme instantaneously. So it almost backfired. But I think the Victor and Rolf one that you just put up, Mandish, was really, yeah, it's it's turned into that performative um kind of industry now like Balenciaga's latest show wasn't it Balenciaga that had the mud they created a muddy environment with rain for what purpose like what was what did what we I don't understand why did we need to well, have wasn't that? that the dirty jeans and the dirty sneakers and stuff no no so this was oh. even this is now they've continued okay. down this trend so it was meant to be, I think, to make um, 
make fashion more dystopian or make it more real or make it more accessible for the masses. But in turn, again, it's almost that mockery of something that is quite seriously damaging to the, you know, to the environment, to the public, to to a lot of things in our world. So to to even images of certain races and certain people. So I think the best slogan there again is 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 my attire is not a costume, you know, or it's yeah. a consum consumer product, uh, you know, all the appropriation that you know the so-called whatever high fashion is doing. Um, yeah, it's the same campaign basically. This doesn't belong to you or something like that. This is not for your entertainment. You know, this is not for your cons consumption. It's yeah. but then I think, yeah. yeah. I think I think what's what's so powerful is that the meme um, and 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 flipping the meme with an, another image and putting it out there in the world at the same time, um, the digital allows that kind of um, possibility with fashion. To I think going back to Mandisha's question, how can we do that with fashion? So this stuff is going out there that has huge ramifications because it reproduces whole sets of violences um, and continues to, to do that. Um, and then how can we do that decolonizing work? Um, yeah, in the material form. Um, so whether it, yeah, so I, I yeah, just trying to think of the, the sneakers, for example, the very expensive sneakers. So, um, yeah, people showing their own dirty sneakers at home. Um, that kind of starts to kind of sort of re make ridiculous the kind of expensive Balenciaga sneaker. And I also and find it really, sorry, really funny, like how you said about that, about people, like we all have dirty sneakers at home. And it's that it's really funny how high fashion tends to pick on or take elements of subcultures. Um, so we were talking about this recently, uh, for example, the, the street culture in Paris, which is predominantly, you know, the, 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 the projects in Paris, the social housing, which was predominantly lived in by immigrants, you know, Algerian, Moroccan, Tunisian, you know, and they created this street culture, they created a music which was very much frowned upon that idea that aesthetic and the hoodies and the sweatpants were very much frowned upon you know people would avoid these areas and avoid these people and make fun of what they were wearing and now you have high-end fashion taking something that they made their own and exploiting it as something um almost you know you know that their struggle is somehow cool or that they relate to them at some level so the same people who are possibly making memes about how badly dressed these youths were are now profiting off of it in terms of fashion so fashion and well the media and memes are, are very closely linked you know they kind of feed off each other in this really really strange way you know it's almost parasitic they kind of live off each other they feed into each other so how do you then make that positive it's a really hard thing to do <laughs> yeah absolutely and i mean just the recent uh, um the re the recent like uh, just a uh, horrific thing that's like happening with sheen and the, the sheen holes on tiktok um so you know the whole buy into sheen has been that it's so cheap that you can just uh, you know order like 200 items and they're worth nothing and people are like celebrating that and making tiktoks out of it and that's really pushing the consumption of these ultra fast uh, fashion items which are then just going to landfill but also continuing uh, you know the horrific labor practices of that brand as well and uh, it's a it's just a terrible cycle and um so yeah like you really do start to see how the media and the use of social media especially is uh, um you know 
yeah, just uh, widening the gap and also just uh, taking people out of away from the realities. Yeah, I find it really uh, disturbing that when I speak to people now about Sheen as well, there's still people who are kind of on the fence of, of whether or not to purchase, to still purchase things from them. And it's a really, you start seeing, you know, things like, like that documentary and things like um, tweets and memes and things, I think you start to see the moral compass of, of, of people in a way. Um, but also the fact that that affects where you buy things or your fashion choices that now we were luckily at a stage where our morals hopefully will prevent us from buying something that is not right really you know um I'd like to think that that's a step towards decolonizing fashion at least um but yeah it's it's really hard to infiltrate these kind of inner systems that have a mind of their own I guess I'm just thinking about that. You talked about it. I was just thinking, well, you know, that sort of memes is the kind of, you know, as I, as I suggested, the kind of language of the common people, these like, easily accessible things of them sharing these sound bites that these thoughts they have. Um, you know, TikToks being memes as well, sort of audible memes typically. Um, and then sort of thinking about the idea of decolonizing fashion, it's, uh, it's like uh, to decolonize fashion, it seems that. The approach needs to be bottom up. So we need to re-educate all those people sharing all those memes, sharing all those TikToks. It's, the, the top aren't going to do it because they're enshrined in those systems of power in which they're trying to make their profits and that, that's never going to change. So I guess it, it has to be that bottom up approach and somehow trying to kind of infiltrate that mass communication, um, you know, whether it's through memes or just kind of general communication amongst people. Sorry, I've run out of steam on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I could I could hear you kind of like fading off at the end, Spike, you know. But um yeah, I think it's hard to have these conversations and sometimes these links aren't instantaneously made. Um but especially with this new generation, um they are making these links. So it's how do we almost catch them at that stage before they go into industry to make an impact because although we might not see the deep relevance that memes or other social media or these conversations have to fashion or like we can't immediately make that connection of how it can help decolonize fashion the, the, the up and coming you know our students do so that worries me to <laughs> <laughs> to a deep extent in that they can already make those links but then this is where that line lies what are they going to do with this information like which direction are they going to go um it's it's getting them to realize how damaging um fashion and media and memes and everything can be and how that feeds into that colonial narrative early before they start making the same mistakes as possibly other generations did. Yeah, and uh, um, I always wonder because, you know, this uh, newer generation are the content creators as well, and they really feed off this media content, like more than anybody else, I would say. And that in itself is such a trap where you know you feel this pressure to participate on the digital space constantly um that uh, you know are you are you aware of uh, those uh, impacts as well and uh, are you participating in practices just for the sake of the content creation as well yeah i mean tiktok the amount of times now i've walked into for example um as i think i teach fashion communication and the amount of times we've been looking at trends and mega trends and things like decoloniality and, and terminology. And when I've asked students to do research, they, they give me TikTok videos. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, do, yeah, would we like to turn off the recording? That's fine and we can just talk amongst ourselves. 
Oh, yes. Um, I, I kept on recording because I thought it was relevant to your presentation. But we'll Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe um, we want to thank everyone first before we turn oh, yeah. recording. <laughs> you, I got, I got, you threw me off and I was like, hang on, do we need to, we need to imminently stop recording now. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks everyone. And I know it's a really hot topic and, you know, um, but I think it's very relevant. I think it's one of those things that becomes a bit more evident when we reflect on the process of fashion design and research and memes and how they function. And, you know, I'd love to have these conversations and I'm sure Spike would as well with anyone who's interested in the function of memes and how they mimic fashion. So thanks everyone for taking part. That's been, you know, it's been amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Nora.